disruptors and curious minds welcome to another episode of thinking on paper this is the first episode in our quantum season yes i said quantum uh we're gonna be talking with uh, a variety of individuals who uh have very uh quite a bit higher domain expertise in the subject than us we are definitely quantum curious uh maybe even quantum aware but uh we're gonna we're gonna rock and roll with that my name's jeremy this is mark you see us every week we also have a book club we read books together. We try to understand the world and uh, ask great questions and uh, hopefully have some fun, fun along the way. Mark, how are you yeah. today? What's happening? It's good. And it was a book that kind of brought us to where we are today. One of our previous guests, Julio Tino, um, when we decided we were going to do a quantum season, I got in touch with him and asked him if he knew any quantum physicists. And of course he did. Um, I don't know about you, Jamie, but one of the reasons we i started doing this and i think you're saying was to speak to people who know more than we do have more knowledge than we do who are experimenting and researching in domains that we're not even aware of sometimes and i think i think today we've reached the the pinnacle of that search because we've got some incredible two incredible guests today i think who're going to blow our minds hopefully Amazing. Well, hey, quick shout out to our friends at Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E. Ripple is marketing's on-demand talent platform. Been a great supporter of the show for quite a long time. Uh, what they do is they bring together these vetted solopreneurs in various disciplines, over 3,000 of them, P.S. Mark and I are in that pool. Should you decide uh, you need our help. Uh, I'm looking for work. Mark is looking for work. We are, um, and these guys basically vet all of these uh, different disciplines, these solopreneurs, and they organize them in teams and point them to your project, whether it takes a week, a month, a year, uh, they can help you flex your internal uh, internal staff towards projects. So WRIPPLE.com, Ripple. Mark, let's introduce our guests and let's dive right in, man. I'm excited. Yeah, so our guests are two... Um professors from Northwestern University in America. We have George Schartz and Anupam Garg. And after the show, I'll do a big long write-up, but perhaps rather than me going into great detail, maybe we could do an elevator pitch on what George and Anupam, how would they describe what they do on a day-to-day -day basis rather than me describing our guests by That a sounds like a wonderful idea. Let's, let's welcome our two friends to the show. Gentlemen, Welcome to Thinking on Paper. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks very much. Uh, George, why don't we start with you? A quick little um, know, a little background on kind of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis, what excites you, where your curiosity lives, and, uh, and then we'll pop over to uh, Anupam as well. Sure. Uh, so, so, I, you know, so first of all, let me point out, I, I'm uh, you know, a bit of a novice when it comes to some of the topics in physics that Anupam is an expert at. Uh, I, I do have a, a training in chemical physics, and, and so, uh, you know, I, I, I'm happy to, to uh, provide my opinion. But my day-to-day uh, -day job is, is more, uh, you know, on the uh, side of nanomaterials and, and uh, their properties and, and optical uh, phenomena that relate to nanomaterials. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I have a very broad range of research, and, and so, uh, you know, we get into more like real world uh, applications related to uh, the usually to something nano, uh, the, the uh, you know, so, 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 you know, issues that have to do with practical issues, you know, such as such as uh, you know, applications in biology and, and uh, the, the uh, and, you know, so, so certain types of materials properties that were that that uh, that are you know evolving in terms of understanding, but but you know deep behind everything, okay, is the is the world that uh, that uh, you know that Amapam thinks about uh, you know very fundamental issues, and so I you know I just I have an interest in this topic, and I have actually read the the book that uh, this group has been thinking about, uh, but I've I've read other books before that uh, on related topics. So, anyways, happy to talk. Awesome, awesome thank George. You. Thank you so much. Uh, Anupam, maybe a little background as well on your side. Yeah, so I'm a professor in the Department of Physics. Uh, George is in the Department of Chemistry. But I, I, I often wonder why these two departments are separate, uh, because we have so much in common. And uh, I admire a lot of the research that George does. I mean, it's, uh, 
it's good. Uh, it's really good practical stuff. And uh, uh, I'm a theoretician, but uh, I, I really feel that uh, experiment is what leads the way. It, uh, it, uh, it, you know, being able to look over the shoulders of my experimental colleagues is is one of the real reasons I am in. in I'm a condensed matter theorist and not a astrophysicist. I, I sort of envy the astrophysicists sometimes because of how bold they are and uh, they can ask uh, questions about things where, you know, we can only see one side. We can't, we actually have to believe that the side that we can't see is like the side that we are seeing. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so I, I do, I dabble in the foundations of quantum mechanics now and then, but uh, I'm not sure I really, I don't, I, I, I'm very sort of aware of the, uh, of the limitations of our language in trying to understand quantum mechanics. And I think we mistake a word association for understanding. And uh, so it's very, uh, it, it keeps me humble. Uh, the ability, the, the fact that I don't understand. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, that resonates with just the, we were talking about grammar this week and how the vocabulary and the English language isn't up to the task of describing the time on a quantum level. Before you jump into the questions on that, can I just, in in Renaissance Florence, you wouldn't have been working separately. And you mentioned then, Anupam, you don't know why you aren't, why you are separate identities in, like, like why? Like how much time do you spend collaborating and talking? Would obviously you'd like to spend more time doing that? Kind of what? What separates you? And what brings you together? And why are you separate departments? George, you 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 know a lot more about the functioning of the university than I do. George, you want to take that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, universities are are uh, uh, I don't know. You know, there's there's uh, right. It's it's. It, it, yeah, these these sort of uh, boundaries are are pretty arbitrary. I mean, the good news is that Northwestern, uh, you know, does provide some opportunities to, uh, yeah, to 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 link in in broader ways in one way or another. And I have been associated with centers uh, that it, you know that combine chemistry, physics, and and other areas of engineering. And and the the uh, you know that that you know think there's a quantum science center for example right now which which is a uh, uh you know a, you know getting at very fundamental issues uh and so so you know in the end i i always tell people i i you know i know you know almost everybody in the physics department and we manage to see each other once in a while uh and you know and so to me it's like i i feel like i'm okay in terms of that that type of of interaction with people so yeah it's it's yeah, it's it's not a it's it, at least for me it's it's not been a serious impediment for me to pursue things. It's it's really interesting. We've been thinking about this a lot, and we we tend to ask like a lot of fundamental questions, and and the, maybe the reasoning for some of that you know kind of separation that you see uh, it, between disciplines, right? Is like as as humans, we kind of want to understand like we in our in our in our effort to understand things we have to organize things into buckets right and that helps our understanding so like it's part of that organizational principle and what what you know your colleague julio uh, otino has, has written about is the idea of like blending across these disciplines because i always thought that's like where the really cool stuff happens right it's like this in-between state of things but let's let me throw something out there um one of the things and i would say i'm i'm quantum curious slash quantum aware, right? I've read some books, but you know, I've, I've never formally studied it. I'm, I'm not a scientist by any stretch, but one of the first books I read on, on quantum mechanics, and actually this ties into nanotech a little bit too, George, is uh, Surely You Must Be Joking, Mr. Feynman, was a, was a book I read that it was like, holy smokes, like there's a whole nother world that I need to really understand uh, that we don't see, we don't feel, and we can't touch, but is all around us. So how do people... Like, how would you pull somebody in? Because a lot of our listeners are, are, you know, curious minds and they want to understand this stuff a little bit more. From a quantum uh, mechanics perspective, what are some of the key principles and how could you maybe simply explain some of those to someone who wants to understand where quantum computing could take the world in the next, you know, 10 to 15 years? George? <laughs> <laughs> 
right? Okay, so so yeah, I mean, you know, so so uh, yeah, there was uh, you know, quantum mechanics, of course, is 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 all about trying to describe uh, matter in terms of waves, uh, and the the and you know, I mean, in the end, there, there's a there's a beautiful history of of just the discovery of of uh, these wave-like properties of matter, uh, and the you know that was uh, you know in a sense it, it sort of started out with trying to figure out the properties of atoms, okay, because uh, that was uh, where the experiments uh, you know led to lots of, of data that was very confusing uh, in the eighteen late eighteen hundreds and not really nineteen hundreds and and ultimately. Uh, you know, right, there was like this leap of, of understanding where people just guessed that maybe there was something involving waves uh, and or and there were other related stories that that uh, that one could, uh, you know, just try it. OK, and, and they tried it and it worked and, and it was it's really uh, fantastic. And, and so so it does give you this picture. And now, since it although it was originally in the context of atoms, uh, you know, uh, we, you know, I, I, you know, we use this all for nanoparticles, for salads, uh, for, for, and of course for fundamental particles as well. And so it just goes on and on in terms of all of the different areas, but quantum mechanics does have these various, uh, sort of, uh, ambiguities and, and areas of, that people argue about. Uh, and of course related to this book that was, that was, uh, that, you know, uh, by Rovelli. Uh, you know, it really gets that that book gets really into the into pushing, uh, you know, quantum mechanics as, as far as one can imagine going. Okay, to the fundamental limits of the very smallest things you could possibly ever think about, and to the very shortest times that you can possibly ever think about. And so, you know, that that's really a a, a very fundamental uh, direction. But nevertheless, uh, it does relate to fun issues like what do we mean by time? Okay. So that's what that book is about. So I'd put it in a, in a, uh, in the following way that I think that you know there are a lot of philosophical questions that quantum mechanics raises, and uh, those are, I, I my own take is that we still have the same difficulty that uh, Schrodinger and Bohr and Einstein and all the earlier pioneers did with those you know there've been advances in things like bell's inequality and so on uh, but they they haven't really made the philosophical problems or the interpretational problems go away but then on the other hand there's i mean you have to pay respect to the other kind of understanding that we have that you know when you are able to use a, a theory or a framework or whatever you want to call it to make predictions, to build devices, to implement technology, then surely there's something about that that we we understand, right? We can make it work. And uh, what I find astonishing is that the the realms in which we can make quantum mechanics work now are are just fantastic. I mean, I, I so you know the the what's being done in quantum computers, for example, the things that I'm most familiar with are the solid state uh, superconducting based qubits. And if uh, I often think that you know if Bohr were to come back and he were to look at these things, he would be amazed at what we are now applying quantum mechanics to. He probably didn't imagine that we would apply quantum mechanics to things like this. I mean, I, I don't know. He was a he was a certified genius, and uh, so he may well have, but uh, I, I'm not sure. You know what's amazing? You know what's amazing about that when you think of like Bohr and Heisenberg and all these guys, you know, thinking about this stuff and and pushing the boundaries and then adding equations that make it provable. Like this was before being able to see anything related to it, right? So, like, how big how big is imagination uh, in this realm for for science, but for you guys personally? Here, oh. just, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, there is always this thing about things you can't see. Okay, and <laughs> you know, but I mean, I, you know, those, you know, the, an interesting um, uh, piece of data related to that uh, is that in in 1900 there were still uh, many 
uh, scientists, you know, scientists that you think of as being well known and famous, okay, who were either not sure that there really were atoms, or they just didn't believe in atoms at all. Okay, mm -hmm. so this seems astounding that that uh, that, that was the case, uh, you know, to us, at least in the modern world, because we see, you know, you look, you know, ever, atoms are everywhere. And yet, you know, in the sense, you know, you don't see them with your eye. Okay. And, and, the, uh, and you, it, but, but of course, you know, we, we're willing to accept that you don't see them with your eye, but you can do lots of different types of measurements where, where you're, where you're detecting the presence of atoms in one way or another. And, and so it, it's, it's a, uh, yeah, so that so that's the whole deal. Of just who you know, being willing to accept uh, things that uh, you know that you might not be able to touch or or somehow sense uh, with the capacities that humans have. A lot of it is is the the consequence, the impact that these exchanges are having on the world around them. Is that the measurements coming from the impact rather than the actual? processes <laughs> well yeah, as 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 Anupam was was alluding to uh quantum mechanics is very much a theory which says don't think hard about the fundamentals just go ahead and calculate things okay and it'll work okay and the, the <laughs> so, so there's so, a famous line by Feynman right uh, shut up and calculate <laughs> <laughs> How that, that's an interesting like aside that how do you bridge? I mean, you can yeah, we can all people some people can shut up and calculate, but the actual impact on humanity is is not going to come from the scientists from you guys alone. It's going to come from you working with the the, the giant corporations who are building these these machines. Like, how are you? Or how how are you? How will you? How should we be bridging this? divide between your incredible minds and the people who are building these things who might not have the same scientific background as you i don't know it just happens just happen okay well, Good. <laughs> that sounds like a quantum, I mean, like quantum we've, we've seen it happen again and again and again right like from the earliest uh, semiconductors which are these crude things that you can you can actually right. probably hold you know body and probably hold it in his hand to this, to v, VLSI and these uh, right. and now these computers where the line widths are measured in nanometers and uh, it's yeah it's mind boggling. Yeah, so what I would add to that is that uh, it, you know in the modern era there are companies uh, you know like Google uh, that have decided that to take a risk and invest in uh, <clears throat> you know something like quantum computing. Okay, uh, at a time when uh, it's not like you can buy an off the shelf quantum computer that actually will do, I would argue, anything useful. Okay, I mean, maybe on a part would disagree with that, but, 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 uh, you know, it's, it's very much an experimental technology. And the people that are working for Google that are trying to develop algorithms are, uh, you know, right there, it's it's all based on the idea that if you can somehow get a quantum computer, then you can do all these, some, some, some things with these algorithms that will uh, play, at least do something for Google that they think is being important and useful. Yeah, so, so I'd add to what George is saying that, uh, that, yeah, I think it's great that we have companies like Google and uh, Rigetti and IBM and so on uh, that are all in the, that are trying to advance the quantum computing uh, uh, issue, but you know, it, it, I, I would actually like to see more involvement of industry in basic research. And at one time, the U.S. did. We had two magnificent labs. We had Bell Labs and we had IBM Research, and uh, they, they they really had magnificent theoretical physicists. You know, who were not who you couldn't really say that they were contributing to. Bell Labs is bottom line in any in any you know direct way, but these these companies had these had these groups and they they interacted with the technologists and there's all kinds of intangible ways in which that 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 led to progress and not just these two companies General Motors General General Electric they all had wonderful scientific labs attached to them and I'd I'd actually like us to go back to a little bit more of that. And there's a there's a little level of that 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 
that happened without the expectation of immediate return, right? It wasn't like, hey, you know, these these guys are expected to churn out four products in the next two years. It's like you you tucked them away in a great spot. You connected them with other disciplines and you let them really think about big things, right? And I think there's a little bit of that missing in in how in how things come out right now because the, there's less patience, right? Is that is that what you guys are seeing as well in in that less room to think big? I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> they, yeah. Well, uh, no, I mean you do see certainly a lot of that because the 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 uh, a lot of the research programs that have become much you know, more applied than they used to be. For those companies that are still doing research, there's obviously a lot of ones that we gave it up completely. Uh, and the the um, yeah, so so that's right. I mean, so that certainly plays a big role. And so it's interesting to see that that you know we were just talking about the quantum computers in the in industry that's you trying to work on either developing the physical devices or developing the algorithms, and the and, and you know the, for them that's that's a, a unusual activity. And so there is a question about just how long uh, are they willing to wait to, to see whether how useful this is. Uh, and, you know, I think it's related also to federal policy as well, just, you know, because the federal government is putting a lot of money into those, the, that direction, the quantum science direction. And, and the, uh, yeah, so there's the, that's a big question as to, you know, just do they understand the timing of the payoff as far as this is concerned. So, you know, and, and you know, of course, in the end, there's many examples from the past where, uh, you know, some new uh, technology uh, got developed that, Took a while before it really became practical. I mean, even if you, even if you look at the original Haber-Bosch process for making ammonia, okay, the original version of that was off by many, many orders of magnitude compared to what would actually be practical. Okay, and it took a while to uh, you know to, to to for people to figure out how it is that you could actually use that in a practical way. So, yeah. I think since we very hard to have a crystal ball. That's that's clear. We don't have a crystal ball, but we have since we have you two here, and this is about the future. And I, I know that there's quantum computing, nanotechnology. We'd love to look into magnetism. But George mentioned about quantum being useful for anything, perhaps nothing at the moment, and maybe there's some disagreement there. But if you could use this technology for something useful. What would be your top three? Where should, a big question, but where should humanity be focusing all of these incredible, this incredible research that you're doing, these incredible experiments, which we'll get into, but where, where should we be focusing? Top three. Um, Anapam first. I, 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 I don't know the answer to that. I mean, I, I really think that, you know, progress comes from absolutely uh, unpredictable, unexpected quarters. Uh, that, uh, uh, the, the, there's, I don't, I think there's some philosopher, uh, I'm forgetting his name, Paul Feyerabend, I think, who has this comment that if you look at the history of science and you try and figure out, uh, try and discover a pattern uh, by which we've made advances. So something for which you might want to do, for example, to tell policymakers where to put money, right? If you try and discover a pattern and you look at the history of science, you'll find that there is no pattern that you can discover, that anything goes, that uh, truly, you know, the, the people working in isolation come up with the most remarkable advances, you know, from left field and uh, and, and sometimes, the opposite. You need a large group in order to crack a hard scientific problem or a hard technological problem. And so, uh, yeah, where to put? What are the top three? No, that's that's a tough one. <laughs> or, or one of one of the top three. Uh, so I'll I'll chime in a little. Uh, okay, so so we we all know that uh, you know. So an example of this is is the use of of uh, what we would call electronic structure theory, solving the, the Schrodinger equation for the electrons uh, in in a solid material or or on molecule or whatever. Uh, and it turns out, you know, I mean, the good news is that by using conventional computers, we can do that 
at a certain level nowadays that is pretty useful. Uh, and so that's, you know, it's already used then a lot. Okay, but it turns out it, it's people have developed algorithms which would only run on a quantum computer. And if you could run those algorithms, that would transform what one can do with uh, that level of theory. You know, in the end, it's an example where people are just saying, oh, here's quantum mechanics. We, we understand, we want, we need to study the properties of electrons uh, in solids. And uh, we just need to be able to solve that darn Schrodinger equation, uh, you, know, it, you know, much better than what currently can be done. And then we can really learn all these, these important properties. So this, this is, and, and it's true. And so in the end, that would revolutionize uh, the, the field. Now, of course, the other versions of things, a lot, of course, there's a lot of interest in, in, uh, in, in, you know, quantum computers for, for security applications. And so, you know, that's, that's one that, that, you know, again, there's all these predictions. Oh, if you had a quantum computer, you could do all this business with secure communications and it would just be, you know, incredibly better than what it currently is. And, and, you know, I, that's fine. I mean, it's something where I, that, that actually, it, uh, is a you know a a, a well-defined uh, you know people know what they need but they just don't have it yet uh, and so that one is is clear and will probably be the first thing that that you, know, you start seeing uh, yeah but I think beyond that you you get into uh, you know Anupam's uh, discussion okay about how uh, you know it will likely lead to uh, other effects that are quite unpredictable. I mean, again, that's another thing related to the topic of this book by Rovelli, which is to say that the future is hard to predict. Okay. <laughs> yeah, well, I, well, well, yeah. But one comment I'd make in connection with what uh, George said, he, he mentioned the words electronic structure. That's a sleeper. Uh, you know, there's, there are missing chapters in our uh, textbooks on solid state physics and uh, major missing chapters that uh, where we don't know, or we don't understand how to understand, how to, the, how to even correctly describe the properties of materials that are down in the periodic table, you know, the lanthanides, the actinides, those things are, are, are and, uh, and it's, it's actually remarkable. That, and I think this is, this is where, where maybe George and I as, as sort of close to solid state physics, would probably differ a little bit from our colleagues in uh, particle physics is that it's it's a, it's it's truly amazing that solid state physics you know which is if you have a, a solid in your lab it has all kinds of dirt in it there are impurities there are defects it's not a perfect crystal there are, there's a, there's an entire zoo of terminology for the various kinds of ways in which the thing can be defected and uh, and yet the two of the most accurate measurements uh, or which are which are you know we're talking at the nine decimal place level are done in solid so there's a, there's something called the ac josephson effect which is actually which measures uh, frequencies or where you measure the frequency and you then get voltage standards and uh, there's the quantum hall effect which uh, i don't know if it's still the resistance standard or not but it's it's another one of these things where you put all these atoms together, you make a solid, and uh, and it has properties that are absolutely fundamental. That it, uh, you get combinations of fundamental constant, Planck's constant, the charge on the electron, the speed of light, and so on, that uh, we can end up that end up being measurable and accurate to nine figures and. Uh, so this is this is really remarkable that that we so this is the old word for this is emergent phenomena that we get these phenomena in 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 complex dirty materials like solids and yet we get these beautiful properties coming out from them and I have a feeling that if we if we understand if we have a better handle on on solving Schrodinger's equation for these more complicated materials then uh, there'll be new things out there. So. So the, the emergent go, phenomenon we, we talk about we talk about the the two different aspects of of how the world works just in general with hierarchical systems and emergent systems right or emergent properties within a system and and how like the business world and industry is very hierarchical but like all the things get discovered like you said there's no pattern to discovery that we can turn into an algorithm and repeat it's like this wonderful emergent process um 
how do you how do you see those two those two things balancing in, when we think about innovation? Like, what's what's the key to getting those two very opposite systems to play nicely together? Go for George. Yeah, you mean uh, the you, you mean getting um, uh, industry to uh, you know figure out a way to em embrace uh, the development of new ideas and technologies that you know right yeah so that's this whole thing about the the uh, you know just how how do you how do you get industry to be uh, in seamless communication with uh new yeah new accomplishments i mean you know in the end of course we always talk, there's all this discussion about the valley of death okay in terms of trying to you know uh commercialize some new technology uh and, and you know and that's that's real in many respects uh you know it's it's uh, i know you know many of my colleagues have been involved in trying to develop new companies that take advantage of some of the advances in that technology that have occurred uh in the last you know 30 years or so and and there are success stories, okay, uh, but it does go through a process, and the process is is uh, you know is some somewhat well defined, but uh, but other times uh, you know it it, it does involve uh, assumptions about timescales for which things will start happening that that are tough, okay, uh, and you know so yeah, so I'm certainly aware of examples where things seemed like they were promising and then they didn't work. Uh, and so, yeah, so that's a, that's a, I think it's a, it's a good point just to keep people talking about it. Okay. Uh, you know, there, of course, you know, the U S government provides some ways that sort of help out. Uh, but, but, and then there's, you know, again, there's many different funding mechanisms. Uh, but, but that's just a, a you know, a, an area that, uh, could continues. I think the important thing is, is to make sure that there, there are, uh, it, you know, just so that, the, you know, the, the lines of communication are open, and they are in, in many respects. Like we, with all this stuff with quantum computers that we were just talking about, uh, you know, is is a case where uh, the the uh, there are industries that are that are interested in it, and so therefore they establish their programs, and then they have, uh, you know, I mean, Northwestern is a good example of that, where where there's all this interest in in uh, you know de programming, developing uh, quantum computer programs and algorithms. Uh, and and that's linked up with with national labs and and you know and further linked up with with uh, various companies. So. Yeah. So I I, I uh, just add to what George is saying that you know he is as as uh, we've agreed it's uh, it's hard to make predictions especially about the future right and uh, and the federal government and industry and all that they're in the business of mostly in the business of the here and the now right and. Uh, and uh, trying to decide where to put your money, where to put your resources, what's likely to pan out, that's tough. And uh, I think the thing that we, it sort of seems to work out, but the part that I think we need to be cautious about is that we, the process should not get politicized, uh, that it should be, you know, we should try and be as dispassionate about it as we can and not have vested interests uh, get in there and skew it, and uh, uh, and if we, you know, if it's done in good faith, I somehow history suggests that as long as the, the, the big institutions, the federal government, the industrial labs, uh, put sufficient resources in there, that uh, you know, scientific advances keep happening and they get turned into useful technology and. Uh, we just, we just. I, I think it's, the important thing to keep in mind is to is to be honest, is to stay honest about it, and uh, and not, uh, you know, have people with or groups with access to grind. And, yeah. Yeah. One one thing that I found interesting, and I, I think it Anupam was in your your write up or CV that I was looking at that um, talked about your interest in. Uh, the cultural implications of quantum mechanical foundations. I think it was, or this 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 connection between culture and the foundations of quantum mechanics. What, oh, uh, what? Talk to me about uh, that connection and that interest. Like it, it to me, it sounds like the application of quantum to society and to the world, right? Which we've been talking about a little bit, but you've read someone else's CV. No, did I say? Uh oh, uh oh. 
<laughs> okay. Well, I may have gotten the streams crossed. No, that's okay. No, no, that's okay. No, no, no. Well, I'm, I'm willing to comment. Uh, so, you know, I don't know the, 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 the impl it's always hard to, to sort of decide what the cultural implications of science are. You know, we, uh, so some groups of course are, are resistant to, to advances in science. I mean, we still have people who, who don't, really don't accept that the earth is round. Right. And, uh, and, and that number of people is growing by the day. <laughs> but, you know, gradually we do and it, it changes our worldview. Uh, we, we, we no longer, we don't think we are at the center of the universe. We, we, uh, we have a different view of life uh, because of the advances in our understanding of biology and biological evolution. Uh, uh, and, and so, you know, it's a... Uh, I go with quantum mechanics. It's it's very hard in that it's uh, it's so foreign to our everyday experience. You know things that we can grab with our with our fingers that it's it's not easy to to see what the cultural implications are. I mean, it's uh, the, 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 there we might it might take a long time. I mean, uh, but before it affects our starts affecting our worldview in in. In ways that we are not even aware of, where you know, which for other sciences is true. If, for uh, some of the other examples that I mentioned, is true that uh, uh, our understanding of disease and germ theory, for example, has has I think that sort of that's buried itself deep in the consciousness of, of a large part of society throughout the world. I think, and it's uh, it affects the way in which we we behave, in which we act, in which we think. And, Quantum mechanics is, is uh, yeah, I don't know what the cultural implications of quantum mechanics are at the moment. Maybe uh, those, it's quite. the same as the as you were talking about the actual technolog technologies themselves. It's emergent and we don't know, and it will probably evolve and change culture in a way that we can't predict and we can't imagine and will be vastly different if we started to, to make predictions. On So, on, okay, I hopefully I've got George's CV right, but... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, just moving on from quantum a little bit, nanomaterials, fibers, high-performing uh, materials. I don't know enough, but personally, it sounds like something which the world is in desperate need of, and they will have very powerful, impactful results across industries, like everywhere where, like, but could you, how are you, like, what, experiments are you running what research are you doing what angle are you coming at it from in terms of industry is that is there where are these nanomaterials being used at the moment what what should i how should i be thinking about these fibers uh, yeah sure well no there's many different directions where where the, there have been um uh yeah where nanomaterials have found their way into practical applications Okay, uh, the, I mean, of course, the, 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 the one that's always easy to talk about are these uh, COVID tests where you suddenly see, uh, you know, like a, a, a red line that, that appears on a test strip uh, and it says you have COVID. I mean, you may not be happy about that, but it turns out it's gold nanoparticles that are responsible for the red color. Uh, that's a technology that actually that, that uh, well, parts of it are really old. I mean, people were making gold nanoparticles uh, in the day of Michael Faraday in the 1850s. Uh, on the other hand, parts of it are kind of new because it turns out that the reason that, that uh, little test strip works is because the gold uh, nanoparticles were combined with uh, various uh, chemicals, biomolecules that would uh, bind to uh, the the COVID uh, parts of the COVID virus, and so the and so in the end, it, it, you know, it's like a, a a very old and a very new technology combined together, and then suddenly it's it's distributed to everybody in the world, and the price of the gold that's in that test is incredibly small, such that it's not, it has nothing to do with the price of the test. So uh, yeah, so that that's a terrific uh, uh, you know evolution. That at the more fundamental level, there there are lots of uh, uh, you know, technologies that are being used for uh, you know both for diagnostics in in, in medicine and, and also in therapeutics. Uh, I have a colleague that's trying to develop uh, improved versions of of uh, of 
the the vet, the uh, methods for uh, for curing cancer that is based on these same concepts: gold nanoparticles and binding them to biomolecules, and and then programming the molecules so that they do something that's biologically important. And so so they so so you know so you can certainly see examples like that. The fibers, okay, they're you know um, there's now uh, you know so that's a good example where. Um, Nano gives you the ability to do, to do what you would call molecular perfection, okay, in building structures, okay, at the macroscopic scale. So carbon nanotubes, you know, are, I mean, people have been making carbon fibers for a long time, but they've gotten better, okay, uh, because instead of little graphitic chunks of material that you sort of pack together and make it into something you hope is, is uh, has high strength, uh, the the uh, in this case you can make these nanotubes which are really just big molecules okay and if you can make them with the right properties then you can make fibers that are uh, better have better mechanical properties than uh, would otherwise and there and there are there and there, so that's a there there are you know, startup companies that are are trying to take advantage of that and and you know of course it's expensive to, to use the nanomaterial so it's always a matter of just what do you have to do to get that to work? But nevertheless, that's that's a uh, you know another version of where the where the nano and in particular, and these again are concepts where quantum mechanics have, have played important roles in terms of understanding what's possible. Uh, uh, you know, are starting to find their way into to the. But going back to the other uh, discussion about well, okay, so so you know, how does that impact society as a whole? A key thing is just for people to realize. Uh, just you know, not not you or I or anybody, but but just you know, just average people uh, uh, that that you know these these advances in technology have been already uh, very important to the lifestyles that we're used to, and and will continue to evolve in that direction. Everybody has one of these phones. Okay, there's a lot of interesting technologies that are buried in those phones, and and you know, they, and yet it impacts on everybody's life. I got a question related to nanotech kind of kind of in general and the idea of you always and this might be I may have picked it up in a in a book or two or just in my little rabbit hole of personal research. But the idea of kind of, you know, turtles all the way down and you have like machines that can build machines that can build machines at like the smallest, <laughs> smallest level. Like how, is, is that a, is that a right way to think about this or is that just like a science fiction left hand turn that I picked up in the wrong spot? <laughs> well, I mean, there's okay. So, so uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we all know about ro robots and robotics and and so forth. And and of course, that applies at many different levels. People use robots to make nanoparticles. Uh, the the uh, but 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 I think in the end, the you know, so that all exists, and and you know, it's a natural evolution of just how technology is going to going to work. Uh, you know, I think that's, yeah, people have to realize that that's sort of part of it uh, and the, of just the evolution of, of that. But, you know, in the end, it's, it's always a matter of just what, you know, what, what does that do in terms of societal issues? Okay. That, you know, what, what is that, uh, you know, is that going to displace people, uh, you know, by robots uh, in some way or another? And so, so yeah, so, we, so that's where the training business comes in. That's where people need to uh, you know, would realize that what they, you know, might have been trained in, you know, 20 years, 30, 40 years ago is, got, you mean, you have to keep reinventing yourself. Yeah, yeah it's, I don't know if it turtles all the way down, but it's at least three levels down. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it. I knew it. Yeah. Those bloody turtles. <laughs> If if you guys are if you guys are up for it and um, no is a perfectly acceptable answer to this to this potential thought experiment, but I, I always think it's fun to kind of just think big and you know maybe even don't worry about if if everything is perfectly accurate. But say say Mark and I are on a mission. We're science fiction writers, right? And we're trying to like land on some really outlandish stuff that you know based on what we know in science today what what is so far out potentially possible um at the intersection of technology or the intersection of sciences or in particular disciplines that you know we could turn into um uh, i don't know a society construct in the future again no wrong answers and you're totally uh able to say no to this question 
<laughs> well, I mean, I, okay, so 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 uh, you know, there's always science fiction. I always struggle with with uh, you know trying to decide where what are the boundaries on what one can think about with respect to science fiction. I know that the, again, going back to the book that stimulated some of this conversation, there's always this thing about uh, you know what do we mean by time and and you know time, time you know and and evol you know doing things which involve uh, you know people that that might you know, uh, age differently and, and, you know, because of time and, and time travel. And, and, you know, it just kind of goes on and on in terms of what you can imagine coming up with as far as, as, uh, uh, you know, right, right. Let's, let's imagine that, that, uh, uh, you know, suppose that, you know, there was, there was a series of books called, uh, uh Mr. Thompson's in Wonderland. Oh, okay. Man. Really old books. Okay. But, they, but Mr. Tompkins lived in a world where quantum phenomena were macroscopic. Okay, uh, so all these waves that I was mentioning before, you know, instead of being, you know, ones that you can't see, they were quite noticeable. Okay, <laughs> and it's just kind of a fun little book from a long time ago uh, that that was, uh, uh, you know, an example. And and you know, it's almost like, oh, you know, nowadays you could imagine going, you know, it's almost like let's go back and and uh, re rethink Mr. Tompkins through again. But now knowing all the new things that we know in terms of what well, was the impact of those macro field, being able to see them what in the story? Well, you know, so yeah, so among other things, uh, you know, people since people would become waves, okay, they, you know, uh, right? Then then you have this deal where people sort of you know they can walk through one another and and. and uh, you know, they're right. There's all sorts of issues about just defining where things are located, and 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 you know, you, you play a baseball game and you throw the ball, and you know, the, right, it looks like it's going right at the bat, but it, it somehow it goes through the bat and so forth. Uh, the you know, it's 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 a it's you know, again, it was not written at a high level, but but nevertheless, it it, it was it, it captured the essence of all those things, um, and and so yeah, so so it's almost like okay, you know, let's. Let's, uh, you know, you know, right. Somebody, it would be fascinating just to now uh, think through what we all know now in terms of common devices and technologies. And Mark, say, Mark okay. and I, that's fascinating you brought that up. Mark and I were just talking about that as we were reading, you know, the most recent chapter of The Order of Time and like being, our, our, our brains don't have the ability to process, you know, the, the small things. And what happens to your brain when you actually are able it's like too much signal right it's too much so maybe there was some design in our physiology that was like hey they they can't process all this stuff we gotta we gotta put a little filter gotta, in there. we gotta escape the tigers we and out and catch dinner we're not programmed to think about <laughs> such like in into planetary time travel um i, I want to hear um Anna Pams, i um take on this just i don't know what science fiction you read jane but thinking oh. about the science fiction i read oh. it's all about giant space structures star wars arthur c Clarke, 2001 the, like the the culture novels it, a lot of that stems back to materials and and it, the, these operatic space ventures are all built on these incredible huge constructs which need these new materials that uh george is thinking about oh sure no no well you know you mentioned all those names and i actually go back to ag wells and uh uh his science fiction which i find absolutely amazing and some of it is not about space travel or people from mars it's uh, uh there's, there's, there's well let's not go back to his stories but i think you know so this actually ties up with quantum mechanics a little bit that one of the things that uh so i'm uh, Everyone has heard of Bell's inequality and Bell's theorem and the fact that uh, the, the ideas that Einstein and company had about, uh, about the nature of reality are, are, are not right. Experimentally, we sort of... And, and so the question is, you know, what is the resolution? And, and if you really think hard about Bell's theorem, one of the, uh, the assumptions that it makes is uh, pertains to what's called counterfactual definiteness. And if I were to try and explain that, I'd, uh, I, this is the example I use with my students. I say, uh, if I had not gone back into my house to fetch my jacket, I would not have missed the bus. Everyone understands that. And it, it sort of makes sense, but you know, can we really prove that? And uh, uh, no, we can't because the, that 
particular sequence of events only happened one time. And it's it's no good saying that it's true in a statistical sense that, you know, 20 days in the year, I actually forgot my jacket, went back and uh, uh, missed the bus. And uh, that's no good. On that particular day, on May the 5th, when you went back into your house and missed the bus, could you have, how do you know that you would not have missed the bus if you hadn't gone back into the house? And, that's, uh, that's the third conditional. It's a hypothetical past. Yeah, well, it's it's it, and and so I would love to see you know science fiction that that somehow uh, turns that into into something concrete where uh, uh, people are actually able to control events by things that that did not happen uh, somehow did happen and uh, kind yeah. of kind of falling into like the many worlds yeah, the uh, interpretation no, no. a little bit and the, well, the wave collapse is just yeah, when the jacket happened right and there's <laughs> All kinds of other potential realities, right? Yeah. yeah Jumping between them. Well, let's let's um this this conversation has been fascinating. I I could I could uh, talk with you guys for longer than you would want to talk with me, but I, I I appreciate all the insights and 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 everything. Um, Mark, let's uh do we want to have them leave a question for our next guest, and then and then we'll do a quick wrap. Um, I think we should. Could I just be, just quickly before George jumps off, one question. And it's my new favorite question of the moment. What is the one question about science that you wished people would ask you, but they never do? Oh, <laughs> oh those are those are tough. Okay, yeah, no, I, I uh, you know, I, I, of course, it, it, ultimately, there's these. We have all these really deep questions that are actually raised raised in the Rob Miller book uh, about, you know, just what what do we mean by time. Uh, what do we mean by by and so I you know uh, you know and, and are is, is it possible that somehow there's you know time is quantized in some way or another in spatial positions and so forth and 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 the uh, you know that's a so so in the end that those are really fundamental questions and so the fact that that you, know, you guys are raising uh, you know the, well those questions and then you know kind of relating to the more more practical things. Uh, is really uh, fantastic, and it was fun to have this conversation. Uh, in, you know, just to really kind of somehow think big and and uh, you know you know <laughs> deal with with complex issues. So thanks very thank much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Go for it, Jeremy. Appreciate it, gentlemen. Um, all right. So uh, yeah, that's a wrap. We're uh, we we're we're talking with. Uh, Talk with two brilliant scientists in multiple disciplines about uh, the state of the world, where we're headed, where we are today. Uh, you can uh, you can find us on thinkingonpaper.xyz. We're on YouTube, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. We also want to thank Ripple, W-R-I-P-P-L-E, marketing's on-demand talent platform. Great supporters of the show. Need a team to flex out on and have them stack for you that has multiple disciplines. You know, give them a shout and uh, they can help you out. Mark, close us out. Book club, talk about it. On the 1st of July, Don Norman, Designed for a Better World, will be coming on Thinking on Paper to talk about humanity-centered design. And I think there's quite a lot of crossover with the conversation we've just had about designing systems for humanity, use the intersection of art and science and technology and design. I don't know. The 1st of July. Amazing. Hey, uh, be curious. Stay disruptive. Keep thinking on paper. <laughs> Thanks, gentlemen. See you soon. Okay.